Uh, I've been listening to this tape recording here of one of my elders. In it, he explains, uh, oh, he's telling story. He said, I'll just, from my uncle here, he said, I'll just uh, be telling stories. Aren't they? Right now, he said, it comes to mind as uh, my father, by the name of uh, translating, uh, the name is uh, he who walks and shakes the earth. Uh, the stories that he told me that uh, about the times when he was a little boy and they lived in the state of Minnesota. He said the people that at that time were very in very great numbers that lived around Blue Earth, Minnesota, and uh, to count an in Indian. We say Ogihija means a hundred, but when you get to say Ogihijate, uh, the big hundred, that's a thousand. He said uh, there were ten of those plus. And some had uh, settled there and uh, began to take on the mannerisms uh, of the white man or the non Indian in that area, that is, to settle on large plats of land and farm. They somehow or another, through the government, had been able to get plows and ox teams and uh, other farm implements, and they begin to farm. They learned to plow and till the soil, and uh, we're doing fairly well. And the Winnebago's themselves, they were forest or, yeah, I guess that's one, well, dwellers of the forest, woodland people. And at this time he says those that live on the plains, uh, in reference to the, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people, uh, which today we call the Sioux Nation, and so there were tribes of those Plains Indians living up there in Minnesota, and they had come and asked the Winnebago's, the whole chunks, to join them in driving out the foreigners so that their land would be rid of uh, the ones who tell lies and whose great white father lives way off in some big white teepee and uh, have the land to themselves again. But the Winnebago's had refused to go along with this idea because they were beginning to learn to farm large acreages and uh, they were sort of monkey style. They were mimicking the non-Indians in uh, raising crops and, and other things in, in great abundance. And they were doing all right, and uh, uh, they didn't want any part of wars. They wanted to be at peace with their neighbors. So at that probably was around in the eight years 1862, the Great Sioux Uprising of Minnesota. And they had... Uh, caused a lot of damage and sort of, like they said, massacred uh, a great number of people. And so the, the uh, citizens of Minnesota had demanded that Washington or the government remove all Indians within that state. So. It was the orders were given to remove the Winnebago's also, but not knowing what was happening, uh, why, as he translated, they, all of a sudden he said they were living uh, nice and peacefully. They had uh, harvested their crops and so forth, and uh, to follow the tape closely was each dwelling 
whether it be a wigwam or a log cabin, it seemed like uh, right about where their bed, bedding, uh, where they bedded down, beneath that they would dig uh, kind of a pit. And uh, they would store their dry corn and uh, beans and other things in sort of buckets that they had purchased from the, the merchants that one bucket fit in one to the other. And so they were somewhat uh, alike, so they called them the twins. And so these are the containers that they used to put their food in and bury them in this pit beneath their beds. Uh, they had split wood and covered the trench up and then they put dirt over it and put their bedding on top of that so that in winter time uh, when everything was froze up they could dig down in there and uh, get as much food out of that pit as they wanted and they would recover it and so they had prepared for stored their winter food up and uh, we're set for the winter when all of a sudden the soldiers marched into the village and without knocking or letting them know, asking permission to come into these lodges, the soldiers walked right in. And uh, of course they had fixed bayonets on their firearms and they would come in and drive out the Indians with a bump in them or probably punctured some of the people and made them hustle out into the cold and uh, wouldn't allow them to pick up any anything in their homes. And this started the march. Some of them were marched over to the, towards the Mississippi and others were marched directly across land towards the west into the Nebraska Territory, or which is now South Dakota. Uh, these that were put on boats, flat boats, that went down to Mississippi, and supposedly they were going to go to St. Louis and then they'll go upstream in the Missouri, all the way up to about where, about 22 miles north of Chamberlain, South Dakota at Fort Thompson. Uh, they had a great Cedar Post stockade built there. And so the boats left for St. Louis and on the way down they were uh, somewhat upset and many people drowned. Uh, there a great number of them died down in the waters of the Mississippi and that and very few of those people uh, ever got to Fort Thompson by coming upstream on the Missouri River to that station. They called it Usher's Landing at that time. Uh, the rest of the one, uh, the tribe that were marched across land, well, they had many old people in there, the elderly could not keep up with the uh, drive. They were herded across there like cattle, and uh, uh, there was a lot of mean things done to them there. In fact, an old man or old lady would fall down and stumble, and being very aged would have a hard time getting up or something, or maybe got hurt and couldn't walk, so uh, put the bayonet to that person and that was it. So they said, uh, or the man said that his father told him that when they uh, supposedly all got to Fort Thompson, the, the total number was 800 out of more than 10,000. So there was quite a there, but the records, uh, as history puts it out, uh, said that that was uh, 
stretching the number a little bit. I don't know. But uh, some places here I am trying to make little changes so that we would be read on schedule with the times of, as history is recorded. Now when they got to Fort Thompson, they, the old man said that uh, when they, those that came by water, when they come to the usher's landing, there was a uh, soldiers on each side uh, stretching from the landing place to the fort. And they had to march in between this line of soldiers all the way up there and be incarcerated in the stockade. Of course, he said uh, those that went on the boat, he said the boats didn't have any covering and so forth. It was all right on nice days, nice weather, but when there were storms, uh, rain, and bitter cold blowing, they, were, they didn't have any shelter on it. And in the Indian explanation about certain things being with them, uh, it's sort of poetic. He said, all this was suffering, but to make matters worse, we always had hunger with us. So it was poetic license that had this interjected there. They were not being fed. And many of them took sick, I suppose. If they died, they just threw them overboard. And things like that. But now when they got to the fort, some days they wouldn't feed us, or we'd go hungry. We'd wake up in the morning, we're hungry, and we're hungry when we went to bed. We had nothing to eat. And finally, the soldiers brought some animals there uh, to, for food, I suppose. He meant they might have brought some cattle. But they were not allowed to do the butchering themselves. The soldier had to do it. He may have skinned the critters, and he may not have, because at times there in the stew they would find uh, horns and hoofs. So it was unpalatable the way they prepared it, because he used the word gichop, which means to chop it up. I suppose they took the critter without removing the entrails and so forth. They hacked the carcass into pieces and threw guts and all right into the pot, or whatever they cooked this substance in, and fed it to the captive Winnebago's in the stockade. Many of them got. Well, it was a dysentery, and they suffered some more losses there. So the head man of the group, he didn't, he said, oh, no, he's a bear clan. Maybe it was the head man of the bear clan, or uh, someone else, or the leaders of the group said, no, in order to live, we will have to get out of here. So if we stay here, we will all perish. And so it was through this kind of talk that the different groups talked about, and so it was decided that they would try to escape. The hills and the country that surrounded the place did not yield very much game. Uh, even a rabbit would starve in that area. So we couldn't depend on setting snares and so forth. They had no weapons of any sort. So they would resort to using snares to catch animals uh, for food. But since that was not plentiful, I really decided now they should leave that country and return to Wisconsin. Since the river, Missouri River, joined the Mississippi at St. Louis, they were 
this was the plotted route. And when they once got there, they would go upstream back to Wisconsin or go to the Rock River and return back into the that seeded area up in Lake Winnebago or Lake Donskonek, uh, where the headwaters of the Rock River began way over in their aboriginal home. So they were allowed to gather wood. So in gathering wood, they would uh, come in contact or come in close enough contact to get messages or sign language somehow to the Sioux that roamed the hills there, and they would uh, supply them with axes, hatchets, and so forth. So this is maybe they did steal some from the commissary, or, well, they got axes so they could cut down cottonwood trees large enough to make dugout canoes and those that didn't made rafts out of the smaller logs. And little at a time, the people began to escape. At night, they would leave the, crawl under the picket fences and uh, get down to where these rafts and canoes were. Or maybe they even rode on, on logs floating down the river just to get away from there. Well, this was a process of escape. And uh, so it come to a time there where the old man, who was called Wahopiniga, now this uh, was also the word used to call a Frenchman a Wahopini. They figured uh, when they first saw a Frenchman, they thought maybe that he was one of the uh, ones that was sent by Mauna down here to uh, watch over the people in, in one of the other stories I explained. And uh, he being part French, he was a half French and a half Winnebago, so he, they called him Wahopinga. Well, he heard his name mentioned. Now, it is his turn as soon as we get this canoe made and he and his family will escape. So in the meantime, the, his wife, yeah, the boys used to work for the soldiers and for pay, they got a little bit of flour. So what she would do, she would save half of it and uh, utilize half of it to make a uh, few cowboy bread, you call it, little biscuits that they would eat and get along on. She was saving this other half for the time that it come their turn to uh, make their escape from the fort. So it comes to pass that this canoe was made and it was their turn to leave. So Hopiniga said that uh, they would leave the fort proper and travel across the river and get into the shade of the opposite bank. And they would tra travel only at nighttime because daytime somebody would see them out on the river there, they would be shot at, which happened to the other Winnebago's and until they began to just travel at night. So, their journey started and uh, brought along their flour and so forth, and uh, they traveled nighttime, all night, and just as day was breaking, they would head for some inlet where a creek or another little stream would uh, empty into the river. They would travel into this area and go upstream a ways and hide out all day at which time the old lady might uh, make a little fire and bake some more bread for them. And this is what they were living on because they didn't dare crawl up on a bank and go out and try to catch any game. <coughs> and, uh, 
after several days and nights of traveling. Because, of course, we was going a little bit fast because we were floating down the river and we would paddle at times, so that gave them uh, a little more speed to cover distance. When the day, daybreak was coming again, so they waited until they saw another stream that emptied into the river, and this had steep banks. And they got into this stream and headed back into it uh, quite a ways to get away from the river, and uh, there the, the missus began to cook some bread. So the old man said, now, you better cook extra, because we're going to start to make a run here, and we're just going to keep on going. We're not going to stop uh, as often as we have. Now, we're quite a ways from the fort, and we should have a little bit more freedom, so we're going to cover a greater distance, so we better cook up a little more bread, and we can take some along for lunch. And while this was going on, uh, all of a sudden, someone said, Hello! And here they looked up, uh, up on a steep bank here, and there stood a soldier. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, we're making bread. So oh, the old man could talk a little English, and he can talk a little French. So this soldier up here on the bank, there he had uh, the officer of the day at that time, I guess, was uh, had some braided yarn braids around his shoulder, and uh, this fellow was wearing that. I said, I'd like to talk to you. So the soldier came down and they visited there a while, and uh, oh, what's that you're making there? I said, we're making bread. Well, I'm going to ask you something. He said, I have two companies of men with me, and for four days we haven't had anything to eat. We've lost our way. We're strangers in this country. Uh, could you spare us that so that my men might even have a bite. Well, uh, you're asking for what we're going to eat, so as a favor, I, I guess we can do that. We're on friendly terms. He said, why are you doing, doing this here, hiding out? So he explained to him what happened. Oh, no, he said, you don't have to worry about us, he said. See, they didn't know anything about the incarceration in this stockade, and there were escapees, so. But they understood that they had miserable treatment, and they were trying to get away to get back to their uh, tribal homeland. So the officer went back up on the ridge and called his men there to signal them or something, and they came down, and they all crowded into this little valley here on the, where this little creek was, and they began to march up. They said that means to uh, use a knife and cut that bread, whatever size it was, the biscuit, into little bite-sized things, and they went round to count out how many pieces each one is going to have, and so and that's what they had to eat. And they were very thankful, and uh, thank the old man Frenchman and uh, Pinga, and then the officer of the day, whoever he was, brought out a paper. He said, I'm going to write you a paper. He said, you don't have to travel this nighttime. He said, you're free to go. He said, nobody is going to bother you. Now, I'm going to write you a paper. 
So in this paper, he wrote what had happened to the, the soldiers and what this individual did. I suppose he said, to whom it may concern, the bearer of this paper or document uh, shared his bread with us. And so if you can, do something for this man. Whatever it was that he wrote, and he signed his name, and uh, then the whole troop, each one signed his name to it. It's sort of a petition. Well, he gave him the paper and said, well, we'll be on our way. Thank you for sharing your bread with us. And when they had left, well, the old man said, well, now that we are told we can travel daytime, there's no need to uh, be so secretive when we cook. Uh, uh, cook up the rest of the bread or the flour. So that's what they did. And they had their meals and took some for lunch and they traveled in broad daylight down the river. So the old lady said, supposing that paper don't work? Well, he said, we'll soon find out. And after traveling all that day towards evening, he stopped someplace and he said, I just for fun, I'm going to look around up here on the, on the top of the bank here. So he got up there and he come back right away. He said, there's a log house there, a little distance here and the smoke is coming out of the chimney. Uh, give me that paper. I'm going over and see these people. So he took the document with him and as he got near the house, the man was outside, and uh, so they gave him the sign and said, oh. And he said, me come a long way. Uh, when I'm hungry, I got paper to show you. Probably is what he said. I don't know if he said that or not, because I'm translating. But anyhow, he spoke to the gentleman that owned the log house, and so he said, come in. And he read the paper, and he showed his wife about this paper, and they got busy, and they gave him a bunch of flour, and, and this fellow had raised hogs and had made his own salt pork. So he gave him a piece of sow belly and um, dried beans and other things, and so salt and pepper, and, uh, the whole works. He shared with him because it said so on the paper. So they, he took his uh, good fortune with him and returned to the where the others were camped and said, that's a good paper. It talks good. So he, he told the truth. And so from then on, they used to guard this paper and, uh, you know, kept it in, as a very sacred document. And they finally came and caught up with the rest of the Winnebago uh, SKP somewhere near Decatur, Nebraska. And when they got there, the, the Omahas, what was left of them from smallpox and uh, war parties coming down on them and so forth. There weren't too many, and so they really befriended the Winnebago's, and they were glad that there were some people who were having troubles too, and uh, there was a little help there. And so what they were doing was furnishing fuel for steamships, so they would chop cordwood and carry the wood down to the river bank and, and stack it up in cords there so that when the steamships would come there, they would buy the uh, fuel from the Omaha's, maybe trade goods or something. So the Winnebago's also jumped into this here, involved themselves in getting cordwood for the steamboats that traveled the Missouri River, which later on they had to pay for in their 
treaty settlement.